Hello, I'm Jan Newharth, Chair and Chief Executive Officer of the Freedom Forum. Welcome to First Five Live, a Freedom Forum conversation series featuring activists and influencers who share their stories about how they have exercised the five freedoms of the First Amendment to ignite change. The goal of First Five Live is to provide differing perspectives and to reach a broad and diverse audience to help people understand and value the powerful role the First Amendment plays in our lives. The Freedom Forum is one of the nation's largest foundations focused on First Amendment issues. Our mission is to foster First Amendment freedoms for all through education, advocacy, and action. We hope you enjoy the program. Thank you, Jan. Welcome to First Five Live. I'm Deborah Barfield Berry, a national correspondent for USA Today, covering voting rights and civil rights. I'm also the moderator for today's program. Our topic is the evolution of the modern civil rights movement from freedom fighter, freedom writers of the 1960s to groups today like Freedom Fighters DC. Today's guests are civil rights activists fighting against injustices not only in their communities, but in others and for others. They come from different eras, decades apart, yet they are connected by a passion to right some wrongs. Mr. Ernest Rip Patton is a veteran of the civil rights movement, including Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, otherwise known as SNCC, and an original freedom writer. And Ms. Wilhelmina Wangange is a co-founder of Freedom Fighters DC, a new group that started in the wake of George Floyd's death and has been protesting all over the city including in front of the Capitol. Thank you both for joining our, our panel. For our virtual audience, you are welcome to send questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try to get to them um, at the end of the program. So now let's get started. Thank you again for joining us. The right to free, to free speech and to peacefully assemble are some of the cornerstones of our country. As civil rights activists, can both of you give us a little bit of how those rights shaped your decision to get involved in the movement. Mr. Patton, if we could start with you. Well, uh, I got in the movement because of something that I couldn't do when I was a young kid of uh, probably nine years old. And that was, I couldn't go in the front door of a movie theater. And I didn't know that at the time because I was uh, lived in a segregated world and that's what I knew. And I had a white friend uh, who lived uh, across the alley, you might say, from us. And we played together. And he went to the movies and, and was able to walk in the front door. And he described all the things that he had seen, uh, the smell of the popcorn and the food and the plush seats, because a lot of the theaters in Nashville uh, were uh, used by our country western singers uh, as auditoriums for them to perform. And so he asked me to ask my mom to take me downtown to that particular theater. And she did. And I wanted to do the same thing that he did because he, he's, he's given it to me. I can see me walking through that front door and smelling all of the good food and sitting in that plush seat. But when we got there, I found out differently. And my mom said, we can't go in that way. We, have to, we had to go down a dark alley and sit in the uh, balcony. And so, uh, and I was nine years old. And then when I made it to Tennessee and I st uh, State University in 1958, uh, was my first year there. But it wasn't until the fall of 59 when Jim Lawson, the Reverend Jim Lawson, started teaching about nonviolence and, and the, the methods of Gandhi. And so I joined that student movement because what they were talking about making a difference in Nashville. And Nashville was my home. So I said, why should I let somebody else come in and clean up my house? Mm -hmm. It's my duty to clean up my house or to help clean my house. And so my mother uh, said that uh, I knew, she said, I knew you were going to join that movement because you were nine years old. You couldn't go in the front door of the movie theater. And I look at that as like, if you have a green thumb, some of the audience might know what I'm talking about, a green thumb, you plant something this time of year and it comes up next year. And so that's what happened to me. That was planted in my soul. And, and so 
uh, 12 years later, here I am going to the meetings and, and, and learning about Gandhi and, and being more steeped in the Bible. Of course, we didn't have computers to uh, and cell phones to take away from the lessons that we were being taught. Not only that, but the churches uh, were involved because the what was called NCLC at that time, the adult group, the National Christian Leadership uh, Council, uh, was made up of whatever Nashville was made up as. The religion part and the nationality were members of that. It was not a black organization, completely black organization. It was not that because Lawson and someone else said, no, we're not going to have a, a solid black organization. And so I think that's why Nashville became the city that that's what happened in Nashville. And, and so for you, Philomena, what? Yeah, I'm, I'm mute. I'm mute, Philomena. Hello. <laughs> we want to hear what you had to say. For real. <laughs> um, for me, my uh, my journey really started since basically as a child. I was born in the Congo, so a violation of my human rights naturally began since I was a child. Um, and just injustices happening in my country, but no one really caring about it because essentially we were black. Um, and when I came to America, uh, there was this kind of respect, perception that America had sold um, in Africa of freedom, democracy, equality. So uh, of course I was excited about it. And then when I came here, I lived in a majority white area called Stafford, Virginia. Um, I faced racism, not just um, from, not just on a social aspect, but in my school system. Um, oftentimes when I was in classes, uh, I was asked if I was in the right courses because I was in advanced programs. Um, I was questioned a lot. Um, anytime that I would even regurgitate any right answers, there would kind of be a question or like, a, oh my gosh, they actually know what they're doing. So it was in su subtle ways from um, being called a roach, um, from not being able to get into certain establishments. It, it, it was very subtle, but it was internalized. And for me, when Ferguson happened, um, it was just a call for me. Because my parents are African, um, because of colonialism and the disconnect sometimes, um, it's easy for them to disassociate and not understand that at the end of the day, we are all black people. When a police officer stops my father, they don't care that their last name sounds African. They just see a black man and they see a dark skinned black man. And that's how they're going to go about it. Um, so when I first started protesting in 2016, I did one in Stafford, Virginia and Fredericksburg, Virginia, which has a slave auction stand uh, that they just removed less than three months ago, um, auction block. So naturally I was called the N-word, I was called all types of things, there were death threats, and my parents couldn't really understand why I would put my, my life on the line for, as they said it, Black people. But I had to sit there and let them know I'm being threatened right now and I'm African and they clearly know that I'm African, but all they see me as is black. So that disassociation that you guys put me in my entire life made it really difficult for me to actually process the internalization that I was doing because you made me feel like I was African. But in reality, I'm not just African, I'm black and I'm a black woman. And so for me, I faced it my entire life and I got to a point where um, similar to Mr. Patton, at the end of the day, I could either complain about it and, and continue to be a part of the system, or I can sit there and say, I'm, I'm done and I'm tired and I'm going to speak up and it doesn't matter if something does happen to me, but at least I brought some sense of, hey, this is not right. This is not humane into a place that is majority white. And I got the conversation going and I was, um, isolated. Church members didn't talk to me. Um, I lost friends, of course, but at the end of the day, I understood that you, when you're part of something like this, there has to be clear sides chosen, and you don't get to appease the white man while fighting for your people. You have to make a decision, and those that are for you will fall in line with you. Mr. Patton, you were very active, particularly when you started in, in the 60s, and we're talking about 2020. Now, what does it say that more than 50 years later, activists are still fighting for some of the same issues you and others fought for five decades ago? Well, um, I think uh, you have to be organized. 
And there are different ways that uh, we did things and we were successful in doing them. And I think one of them is uh, to boycott. To boycott. And when you get into people's pockets, they start listening. And one, that's one of the things that happened in Nashville. We just so happened to pick the Easter season to boycott downtown Nashville in the 60s. And shortly after that, things opened. Uh, the more blacks were hired in different positions in the downtown area, uh, not only in the downtown area, but throughout Nashville, throughout Davidson County, which is Nash takes up Nashville. Uh, so there are different ways that you, and different things that you can do to get people to listen to you without being violent, without burning, without looting. And, and one is to, uh, get in their pockets. And Philomena, what if anything can you and other younger activists learn from the veterans of the movement like Mr. Patton and others and, and others who just passed away? Several icons have just passed away. Um, I think one of the key weaknesses of our era's movement is uh, a lack of direction. Mm -hmm. um, and when I say that, uh, Unfortunately, we don't have uh, the privilege to have clear cut leaders. Of course, you can call me a leader and call someone else who's a grab food organizer a leader, but that, that those distinct voices, although uh, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X had two differentiating styles, they were both clear cut voices and there was a sense of direction and people to follow. Right now what's happening and why it's, it's essentially stagnant is because Yes, there's a collective understanding that we all want the police defunded and um, we know that things that are happening need to be changed, but it seems that there's a, dis a disconnect on how to go about it. Mm -hmm. And so when something like that is present, there has to be conversation, there has to be humility, and there has to be that lack of everyone wanting to be seen. And that's one of the biggest things right now that's um, lacking in our movement. It, and something for myself that I try to emulate um, past is just remembering why I'm doing this because what I've seen and I've seen consistent with a lot of young um, protesters is it is it begins as something that is a duty to your people and to liberate them and then it you know you get that momentum and then it turns into a, a self thing and, it, and, you, and you start using your platform to kind of elevate yourself. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, John Lewis, the Freedom Riders, people made them what they were. They didn't search for that. They did what they needed to do. They were organized, they were tactical, and that's what made people talk about them. That's what made people put them on the pedestal because of what they were doing and their focus. But for our generation, it seems that people are looking to put themselves on pedestals. And in that sense, the message gets disconnected. The message gets confused because then people start to lose trust in you because now they see that you're not serving them, you're serving your own ego. And I think that that's something as our generation we need to work on is not only being organized, but understanding what is it that we want in the end goal. Because some of us are reformists and some of us are abolitionists and those two systems can't work for the same cause. With all these demonstrations happening all over the country and with the March tomorrow in Washington, what do you hope, both of you hope comes out of the, today's protests and demonstrations? What do you hope they can do and will do in the middle of this new and social unrest, I guess we can call it new. May I, may I uh, say something first? Of course, Ms. Ben. Uh, uh, Philomena, uh, I think uh, you have to take charge and not with your phone or with your computer. You have to have people who believe in the same things that you believe in. You have to be organized. Uh, when you want a, say for example, you are the president of your organization, you need a good vice president. You need somebody who is able to write uh, um, uh, to the media so that when the media comes to you, uh, you are able to give them something and uh, it's written down and you stay with that have people on your committee who know that you are the out front person. They are there to support you. 
in numbers. What we see now on TV is you got to, you don't always know who the front person is because the people that are with them are making all the noise. You don't need the noise. You need somebody, for example, here in Nashville, uh, a young man wants to talk with the governor. Well, the governor is not going to see him because of the organization that's behind him are making slurs and, and all kinds of things. They're saying everything on TV, or if they're not saying it directly on TV, you now you have a cell phone. And so people are taking pictures and they're passing it on to the media. And, and you don't need that in your organization. You need to be the front person. And for example, if you want to meet uh, some important person in Washington, D.C., that committee has to be 100% uh, behind you. When you go into that office to talk with a, a mayor or a governor or whomever it may be, they, they are only there to support you and to keep their mouths closed because you know what you want to say and have a press release that says exactly what you've already said to the person that you are talking to so that there's no mistake. You need sergeant at arms. We had people who were sergeant at arms to say that they said, okay, Diane is speaking, be quiet. See? But now you got people nowadays, they want to express their own opinion, even though you are the front person. So you have to be careful about who you have in your organization and, and, and they need to know why they are there. And with these sergeant of arms, and you cut down on, for example, uh, looting and burning, because you can say that person is not a part of our group. I don't know who he or she is, but that person is not a part of our group. So you can't put that on us. I'm here to speak to so-and-so. This is my organization. This is my group. And what we did, I, I give you an example, April 19, 1960, our lead attorney's home was bombed at 5.30 in the morning, C. Alexander Luby. We had over 5,000 students do a silent march. We had two people speak for us. And one of the, two of the names you're familiar with, Diane Nash and the Reverend C.T. Vivian. We called the mayor and said, Mayor West, we will be at the, at the uh, courthouse at 12 noon. We would like to speak to you. They did that. The students had a silent march, three abreast. We had uh, people who were walking beside us as we were walking down the street. If I wanted to say to some, something to the person next to me, they would warn me, this is a silent march. We only want Nashville in footsteps. So when we got to the Capitol, uh, to the courthouse, the mayor was waiting. C.T. Vivian, Reverend C.T. Vivian spoke some words to the mayor then he turned it over to Diane Nash. Diane simply said, Mayor West, do you think it's fair that people can go downtown and shop and not be able to sit and eat at the lunch counter? He said, I don't think it's fair. That's when you heard the roar of the crowd, the hand claps because of what he has said. Later on that afternoon, TV people went into his office, the press was in his office and made reference to what had happened at noon. And uh, they said, uh, Mayor West, uh, you made a comment to Ms. Nash. He said, she asked me a question, and I had to answer it as a man and not as a politician. And so within, within less than three months, we desegregated the, the uh, restaurants downtown Nashville. No other city has done that. No other city did that. And we had a silent march. Now just think, what if we had been looting and burning because our lead attorney's home was bombed? Mm -hmm. You can't get anywhere like that. So in your organization, make sure you've got the right people. Talk to them face to face. If there's a meeting, then use your phone or your, your computer to say, hey, well, there's a meeting here tonight. There's a meeting here tonight. You can do that. But otherwise, you know, you, you are out front. And so you need people in your organization that's going to listen and agree with what you have to say. And I'll move on from there. Thank you. 
Philip, uh, if I could bring that question to you then, what, with all these demonstrations happening and with the march tomorrow, what do you hope comes out of that? Well, and I, I understand that you might not be part of tomorrow's, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Could you give us a sense of what you hope comes out of the ones that you've been a part of? And why do you not think that tomorrow's does all that you think it should do? Um, I mean, it's clear, like, defunding the police is um, my biggest thing um, okay. with that. Um, I also think just in the sense of a sense of direction. Like we've been yelling, defund the police, defund the police. And I know, um, I know my group, we released um, demand, listen demands and you know, where the funds can be allocated and things like that. But that sense of direction isn't consistent with all of us as a movement. So for me, I think that in order, before we talk about the vision we have, we need to kind of be in one accord about what the vision is to begin with. Um, beyond just defunding the police, because I think because we're in a social media age, things get trendy, they become hashtags, and that's what everyone is saying, but not everybody's understanding, okay, defund the police, and then what? Because clearly we can't just be in an institution where there's no one to oversee and be present when things happen. So when we say defund the police, then when we say, okay, what's next? And I think for me, that's the conversation that needs to be had because the protesting is one thing, but then it, it's going to start to get stagnant and people do get tired and it's going to end up being a circle where essentially it's going to end up like Ferguson, where there was outrage, um, people were getting killed off, and then eventually it kind of just died down. The brutality was still happening, but these conversations weren't happening as much or on a broad scale like they are now. So I think before the momentum dies down, we need to actually figure out what is the next step? Okay, we say defunding, so what if they grant that to us? Then what is what do we want America to look like after? And so for me, the protesting is great, but I think now we're at a position, it's been two, three months where we need to discuss, okay, what, what plans are we going to implement uh, as a national level on a movement? Because we call it a movement, because we associate all of us as a collective, but we're not necessarily making decisions as a collective, and it shows. And I think that's, that's where I'm at is in um, regards to the movement is I want us to have kind of meet all the people in DC. It's called the Palm Collective, where all the organizations are kind of like under one leaf and we do different and they do different um, things together. And so they work like that and we talk about what we want, what we want to look like, mutual aid, things like that. That's a consistency, but we can't say that for every single state. And so I think that there needs to be some kind of unification, some kind of talk amongst all the leaders in one area so we can get in one accord. People can have um, their own interests and their own things that they want to see on a level, a local level. But if we're going to sit here and talk to the government and say we want certain type of changes, we need to actually discuss what those changes are going to look like as a collective or it's just gonna be different precincts, different things giving different things because there are certain precincts that are actually giving in and are listening. And then there are people that have not made any type of progress. And it, it just, it cannot work that way. So I think for me more so is unification and a sense of direction um, is what we need to be talking about and not just protesting. Okay. Let me remind the audience, if you have any questions, please feel free. And you, you brought up momentum and there, there seems to be that it's, there's still protests, there's still demonstrations, there's still town halls, and Mr. Mr. Patton, there are not any mass meetings, but there's still folks getting together. What does it say about this moment? What does it say about now that folks are still, if I could say riled up, or at least still seem to be passionate about this? What is it about now for both of you that you think that it's still happening, that we're still talking about a march tomorrow and marches yesterday and all over the country. I think I'm not happy with, uh, uh, they haven't seen the changes that they're marching for. And <clears throat> I really do believe that uh, if there were some changes made or if they went about it, I don't know uh, how to say, go about it a different way, especially with the looting and burning. Okay. Uh, have a more peaceful demonstration I think some uh, changes will be made a lot quicker. Uh, let me say this too. When I was coming up, we had policemen, uh, once they hired black policemen here in Nashville who walked the beat. And what I mean by that, they walked through the neighborhood. They got to know the kids in the neighborhood. They knew the different families in the neighborhood. So they were able to communicate what was going on in that neighborhood without uh, shooting somebody or uh, little Johnny might be mentally retarded. 
So they knew that. They knew that if something happened, that we're not going to shoot him because he his his mind is somewhere else. Uh, the parents knew the policeman. And so one of the things I would like to see is for the police department to go back to uh, having policemen walk the beat and walk uh, they had a certain community that they would walk through. And people knew them, and they knew the people, and they had a good, uh, what you might say, a good beat on what was going on in the community. Because a lot of things happen where it's black-on-black -black crime, and the community doesn't say anything. Maybe it's because they're afraid to say something, and something might happen to them. But I would like to see uh, the policemen walk in the beat and uh, get to know the community and the community getting to know them. And that might make a difference, uh, uh, some kind of difference. I think it would make a difference. So, I mean, for you, what is it about now? I know you said that it, that it seems to be all over the place, but there's still movement and momentum, as you put it. What is um, it about now that you think has people saying, we're going to stay in the streets for a little bit? We're going to stay in the streets. I have to agree with Mr. Patton. I think people just have not seen the change that they're marching for. And I also think that uh, it's discomfort too, because mm -hmm. with 2016, you know, um, the men died out because people got back into their regular routines. And, you know, when you get back into your regular routine and with everything going on that's so chaotic, you know, you focus on that. A lot of people are just focusing on surviving right now. So for me, I think really what it is, is it's hard to ignore. Because although um, that's the good part of social media is that Black Lives Matter is everywhere and it's not just everywhere. It's also, it's on Netflix. And that's where a lot of my generation, a lot of people in general spend time on. It's on Hulu. It's on all these different atmospheres. It's even on your television screen. It's even when, for me, I've seen more commercials with more black people in it, actual dark skin being more inclusive. So those things like that remind you what we're fighting for. And so even though you might take the break, which I do too, you might take the break from you know being on the front lines and things like that, you're always going to have something to remind you that there's something still very wrong with this country. And so for me, I think that's more so what it is. That's why momentum is not going to be lost anytime soon. And although I'm not the biggest fan of the March on Washington tomorrow, I do think that because of how much media attention it's going to get and how it's going to be televised for those people that have been kind of living in their bubble and just kind of like, oh, you know, Black Lives Matter, but my life goes on, they're going to be reminded again that, hey, there is an entire movement going on and we need to be present or essentially you're part of the problem. And I'm not saying don't live your life. I'm not saying completely be engulfed all the time because mentally it's not healthy for you. Take the spaces that you need. But at the end of the day, even if you, you're not a person that can be on the front lines or be at a protest, do your part. Do your part, whether it's sharing the petition, whether it's sharing the GoFundMe or someone that just got brutally murdered and their uh, family can't afford. Do your part. It's literally all I'm asking. And I think right now, as a collective and as human beings, we're starting to understand that you don't have to be the person that's in front of face of everything, but you can be the person that shares a post with someone or shares this or amplifies a video or, or makes a petition go. And that little effort is enough and it is moving the movement forward. That segues perfectly into a question um, that one of our um, audience members asked, and that is, what message would you share with white people who want to make a difference? Either of you? All the one I can think of, uh, a white person that wants to make a difference, to get out there and make a difference. That's, the, that's what comes up first, is get out there and make a difference. And if you really want to make a difference, then that's, that's what you do. Uh, things that you have to, uh, there might be some things that you might have to give up. You might want to be, uh, you may have been one of those uh, white person who, uh, said, oh, well, they're not, they're not shooting all those black folks. They're just saying that. They're not doing it. Now that you have all these cameras and the media and people with cell phones, because in the news, you will see people, whites, who say, well, I didn't know that was happening. You know, because it's uh, with the, with the cell, again, with the cell phones and and people taking pictures and, and the media showing you what happened. 
because I see any number of, of whites who say, well, I didn't know this was going on. And it's been going on for years. But now people, there are more cell phones and, and you never know uh, who's taking your picture when you're doing something wrong. And, and some of these young people, I think they're getting away with it. Here in Nashville, when they uh, set fire to the uh, uh, one of the buildings downtown, well, his arm was showing, and he had all these tattoos. And somebody was just there with a camera, uh, a freelancer, took his picture. Next thing you know, uh, the police are at his door. The guy that set the trying to set the uh, building on fire. So you have to be careful with these phones and, and you never know who's around you. But we didn't have that back in the day. Of course, we didn't loot and burn even uh, in some places. Now, uh, I know in Nashville, when Dr. King was assassinated, there was some uh, burning. I don't know if there was any looting, but uh, there was some burning. And Stokely Carmichael was there urging that on. I have to tell it like it is. He was there urging that on to do something. But uh, with the, these cell phones and things, you have to be careful. Fleming, would you like to address that or, or there's another question for you? Um, as regards to uh, white people that want to make a difference, like, yeah, make a difference. And then on top of that, just be conscious of weaponizing your privilege against black people. Because one thing I've noticed with growing up with white people and having a white godmother and have and just having white relatives in general is unless you're uh, raised in a home that is open to black people and understands the concept of we're humans just like you um if you're raised in a different environment um some of the things are just unconscious they're just the way of life for you and so I always urge white people before you sit here and say, I want to do something, have a real self-respective conversation with yourself about ways that you might have weaponized your privilege against black people and didn't realize it or things that you were doing that are unconscious but are racist. It's not an easy conversation to have. And more so what I would say in a nutshell is look yourself in the mirror and understand the role that you played in being a part of the problem. And then from there, then you can be someone that we can consider an ally because you've done the work to look into yourself. But a lot of people try to say, okay, well, I've benefited from privilege my entire life. Now I see something's wrong. Let me have black people. No, it doesn't work like that. Because at the end of the day, whether you are a white person who has always understood that we are, he was just like you, you're still a white person and you're still benefiting from privilege. So I just think it's more so of just looking into yourself and understanding that and understanding the roles that you may have played and just taking that accountability and then allowing, allowing us to move forward as allies. Ms. Ms. Benjamin had a question directed to you. She asked, what did she wants to know, she wants to hear from you, but what do you see as the most pressing issue or issues with tomorrow's March on Washington? Um, for me, uh, originally I was going to uh, go, and I am going, but I'm not more so going to be like a participant, really, I'm until like later on when there's actual protests without like celebrities and stuff and figureheads there. My thing is, um, I'm not for reforming. My stances are pretty clear through interviews and where I stand. I, I believe in being true to what I believe in, and I, I just, I'm not going to march with Mayor Browser knowing that she is purposely finding black businesses in DC and sending police officers and giving heads up and tips to white establishments. And this isn't from a news media that I've gotten. This is from me going to DC. This is from me talking to black businesses and then recognizing me as someone that can amplify that and get that out there. So, and um, it's been a lot of Africans as well too. So for me, um, I just, I can't. Because at the end of the day, I can't sit here and say that I'm against something and I, I'm against oppression. I'm against uh, the level of violence that the DC police officers use on um, protesters and then go and march with you and be kumbaya. Like at the end of the day, I understand what the concept is. I understand, you know, what the March on Washington was with Mr. King, and I understand that. But there's just a lot of disconnects for me as an activist right now that I'm not comfortable with. And also the lack of reaching out to organizers 
um, when you're coming to our city. That would be mm. me. That would be as if I was in the time of Mr. Patton and I'm coming to Nashville and I'm going to organize this huge march on Nashville and I'm not even going to recognize the work that you've been doing that's even put Nashville on the map as anything to protest at. To me, that's it's a slap in the face because we've been out here, we've been making sacrifices, we've been doing the best that we can with what we know. And as a figurehead that I've looked up to my whole life, Al Sharpton didn't reach out to any of the grassroots organizations. And so for me, and even the ones that he did, uh, the few people, he actually denied them speaking because he felt like whatever was being said was too radical. So clearly, whatever you're trying to promote is not in alignment with what we're fighting for. And I'm not going to sit here and try to break it down because I understand that for a lot of people, this represents a sense of unity and having a leader, someone they consider a leader coming forward and watching and kind of leading. So I'm not gonna take that away from people, but on my end and the things that I'm trying to promote, I have to stay firm in my convictions. Gotcha. Well, one other question from an, another audience member, Mr. Tolbert. He says, strategically, do we need to be more savvy with our language? For example, the funding, he put in quotes, is open to political polarization, he thinks. Programming, also in quote, or reshaping funding and service needs promotes thought, more openness, and creating new pathways and collaboration. What do you think? That's his question. So, Lena? Um, uh, yeah. You know, um, language, language is a tool of the media. So that's something that you have to understand with anything that language is a tool of the media. Um, like I was saying earlier, we live in a social media age where if something catches on, it just goes with it. Um, and defunding the police is just something that has been consistent. Everyone has been using. Um, but like I said, do, does everyone that is saying that understand the depth of what defunding the police is? No. All they hear is taking money away from the police, but they doesn't really, they don't really understand. Okay, if we're as activists saying taking money from the police, when I say defunding the police, I say defunding the police to put to allocate that money elsewhere that can help Black people. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying defund the police and then let's not think about what to do afterwards. If I'm saying defund the police, I'm saying that money that you're using, you can help to work on the food deserts that are struggling in a local DC area. I'm talking about implementing mental health training for police officers so that they can understand that. These things are still being allocated in within the police, but they're being used to actually, I guess, as you're saying, reprogram it and make it actually standable for Black people. So that's what I say. But I think a lot of the times, the news media and just social media in general, they get something, it sounds trendy, and they kind of water it down to a concept that everyone can grasp. And unless you're a person that is willing to educate yourself and is willing to understand basically the optics of the movement and the things we're saying, you're not gonna understand that. And in the same breath, you can say, yes, you know, um, we need to be careful about wording, but at the same time, for my 50-year-old mother, defund the police, she understands what I'm saying, but saying it that way makes it easier for her to grasp. So you have to look at it from both you know, both stays. But I think for me that when it comes to these wordings, we don't mind them because we created them. We made them trendy. We said them so many times as a collective movement in different places, whether it's DC, whether it was Nashville, whether it was Portland. That is what we've been saying. That's what we're consistent. And that's why I said, even though the sense of direction of us as a movement may not be clear right now, there are certain concepts that are clear. And so we use the same language over and over again, because at least then we see as a collective, we're all consistent in that, in, um, in that wording. And so that's why we, we stick to the words that we stick to, because even though the directions may be different, those wordings and um, how we use them are understood amongst us. So it's not really about how the individual interprets it. It's about us as a collective understanding that the one goal that we do have and the clear direction that we do have is defunding the police and we understand what it means. And if you do care to understand it, you can ask us, you can reach out to us, or you can do the research and understand that. And at that point, that's no longer my job. That brings it, Mr. Patton, speaking of media and, and Philomena, you brought media a couple of times. You, the, the strategy of 
the civil rights SNCC and others back then was to use the media in, in a way to deliver in your message and or show what was happening. How's the media doing now? If there's any way to measure how we're doing now in terms of the message, the message back then and the message now, tell the truth. Well, we had, uh, for example, we had ended up with three different uh, forms of media. Uh, we had two newspapers. One was the Banner and one was the Tennessean. And I look at those two papers as the Banner being, uh, if I may, the Republicans and the Tennessean was the uh, Democrats. And then uh, NBC came in with a documentary called NBC White Paper to cover uh, the movement in Nashville because the Nashville movement was such a, a different movement than anything uh, that had happened. And so the Chamber of Commerce did not want NBC to record what was happening with the sit-ins and, and all the things that they did record. And there's a documentary out there called NBC White Paper. So you, I would think that uh, uh, the reporters were reporting what was happening. Again, we didn't have uh, the uh, cell phones to get the extra pictures and what happened. So you saw what actually happened. You saw it on TV. You may have missed a lot. For example, uh, the uh, head of the police department called the fire department to come down on Fifth Avenue, which was where all the stores were, to use hoses. But the, the, the person that was in charge of that particular fire truck said, there's no fire here. So there's no reason for us to use our equipment because they were firemen and they didn't do like they did in Birmingham with Bull Connor and those students who were simply marching because uh, James Bevel was the one uh, who was a part of the Nashville movement, spoke to them about uh, desegregating uh, Birmingham and what have you. And uh, of course, the adults didn't like that, but uh, he said, children don't have jobs. They don't pay bills. So the, the adults, uh, we don't need adults to do this demonstration. And so uh, you have to, uh, again, we had, like I say, we had those two newspapers, but uh, it was NBC that did the documentary that really showed what was going on in Nashville. Thank you. One last question, just to know you both are activists in your own right, but if there's any one civil rights activist who you would like to meet, who would that be? Could, could have been someone who's not here anymore or, and, and why? Um, first. Next. Oh, <laughs> go ahead. No, ladies first. Okay. Um, yeah, Malcolm X for me. Um, I, I just, I don't know. It's just when I see him talk, when I hear him. It's just, it's just raw, and it's, uh, and it's, it's, it's just him, and everything he says, he feels, and you feel it. And um, I think for me, a lot of times, uh, the reason why people root for me is because of my passion. And so a lot of times I watch Malcolm and I, and I, and I, can, I can't understand it what people tell me. But when I watch Malcolm, I, I say, oh, okay, maybe that's it. Because when he talks, I get chilled. And I, and I wish I was there. I wish I could talk to him and ask, um, ask for direction, ask for this, how I can go about this. Because Malcolm was very beyond his time. And he was so intelligent and he was so strong. And even, even facing his death, he always knew he was going to die. But he made peace with it and it never deterred him from doing what he was doing. And for me, I just, I can't really imagine the level of sacrifice that was made, not just with Malcolm, but with any leaders at that time. Because for us, things are bad. And um, I'm not gonna water them down or anything. But when I look at the circumstances that they had to face and the circumstances that we had to face, there's this level of comfort that we have that they don't. Like there is bailout funds for people, you know, there's, there's thousands, thousands of dollars of bailout funds or people trying to raise money every single day. Um, I can still go to the movie theater 
they're where they're I can do all of the things. Yes, there's racism. Um, yes, there's a divide, but it's nowhere on the level or magnitude of what they were dealing with. And for me, there's discipline in my generation, but the level of discipline that I now realize as an individual, not just an activist, that had to be within you for you to be getting treated like you were less than a dog and you wake up every single day and you still go out there and you fight regardless of people invalidating you, arresting you. Like even that famous picture of John Lewis smiling while he got arrested, like he knew, they always knew and they knew, hey, today may be the day that I don't make it out this jail cell. I may die today. But I never, ever, ever show the opposition that I'm afraid or that I'm weakening. And that in itself is something that I think I'm still grasping as an activist, but it's something that I admire in Malcolm, and it's something that I admire in all the civil rights activists, to, to stay strong and to stay consistent and vigilant despite people invalidating you, despite people calling you names, despite it, no one caring that they're calling you names. And that's all the difference for me. People care right now. The world is condemning America. All these people care, but videos, things like that. And so for me, I just, I just can't imagine how much it took out of them to keep pushing. And so for me, um, I feel like there's really no excuse for me or any activist to not keep pushing because we have it a lot, I, I'm going to say a lot easier. I, people are going to take that how they're going to take that. But the reason why we get to exist and protest in the ways that we do and to even have a peaceful protest where police officers just stand and look at us and even that being able to be a thing is because they couldn't even have that. They couldn't even exist in those certain circumstances. So for me, I understand the sacrifices that were made by them. So even though, so that I could be able to protest the way that I do in the comfort that I am. Yes, it's not perfect. It's not equality, but it's a whole lot different than what they had to deal with. Mr. Patton, thank you. Well, for me, I, I only have two names. Okay. If I could sit with Gandhi, uh, for as long as possible, then come back to the States and sit with James Lawson. Mm. Uh, that, those are my two, uh, because uh, Lawson, uh, I was just standing beside him just a few months ago. It's like being beside your first grade teacher. You never forget your first grade teacher. And so uh, to me, uh, again, it would be uh, Gandhi to learn all that I could from Gandhi and then go and sit with Lawson to say, what did you learn? And, and what makes you the person that you are? And uh, it's just, those are the two. Those are the two, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you both for this wonderful conversation and your insights, and more importantly, for your work in the movement. Um, I recently wrote a story and I talked to Philomena for that story as well about some of the civil rights movement, the activists of, of, the, of the 50s and 60s and some of the of today. So feel free to go look at that. It should be in a chat. But also make sure you go to freedomforum.org to look for more information, um, to more, more information about this program and others. So thank you so much again for joining us for this panel discussion. Very insightful. Thank you for having me. Appreciate you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.